Good night, everyone. Just want to welcome you another night to the Mental Health Revival Series here at High Park, Journey to Wellness. And I don't know about you guys, but I have been blessed over the night um, with Pastor Cadet, um, Dr. Sewell, and tonight we are going to have um, Sister Chanel Christian, who is going to bring us more wholeness. And so I'm just, yeah, amen, amen, yeah. amen, amen. And the biggest thing about this, you know, I was home saying, our babies are coming back to help us out. To God be the glory. So we are very blessed here at High Park. And so we, are, we also want to invite those who can make it out to come out so we can encourage each other. So tonight, again, I welcome you. Get your notebooks out and get ready for some powerful messages as our sister will present to us tonight. At this time, I want to ask us to stand so we could pray and welcome the Holy Spirit one more time. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, broken though we might be, but God holding you. And so we come tonight to give you thanks and praise, and we thank you, Lord, for our leader who have put these things together for us, realizing that we all need wholeness, and so, but our wholeness cometh from you. So tonight, God, we are just praising you, and Lord, we thank you for what has passed, and we thank you for Sister Chanel as she will present to us tonight. We give you all the, those who are on their way, bring them safely, dear God. The group that met before, we thank you. And Lord, continue to bless this series. And may many, many souls be blessed, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome and be blessed, those online and those who are here. Be blessed. Thank you. Amen. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so tonight we're going to review the quiz we had last night. So I hope we are ready to go. <laughs> okay. So last night question was, we should not allow our blank to dictate our blank okay so the answer for that is we should not allow our situation <laughs> to dictate our revelation <laughs> all right well, that's fine <laughs> so <laughs> it's all right <laughs> Question number two. Someone's word or action can blank your trauma history. Is a trigger? Yes. Someone's words or action can trigger your trauma history. All right. Question number three. Trauma can affect the way you view yourself. True or false? What's that? True? Trauma can affect the way you view yourself. Yes, that is true. And number four, Joseph's blank allow him to prepare for his family. Joseph's blank allow him to prepare for his family. What do you think that was? Joseph's, okay, here's the answer. Joseph's wholeness. His wholeness. Allow him to, be, to prepare for his family. In other words, you know, he forgave them. He didn't hold things against them. So, you know, he, he was not, keep, things were not boiling up in him. So we have to learn to forgive each other. And I think some of the, the mistakes that we make sometimes is if someone do you wrong, you kind of wait until you see them to say, you know what, what you said last night make me feel bad, you know, but I forgive you. No, you forgive them right away. <laughs> okay.
So when you see them, you already forgiven them and things will be fine. Okay, so now let's go to tonight's question, which reflects on what happened last night. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> you didn't pass the things out yet? Oh, okay. And by the way, we have, we have winners from last night, so we have some gifts. I thought the cards and pens were given out yet. Okay. So, Sister M. Louidor and M. Samuel need to see me after. You have your cards now? Okay, are you ready? Question number one. Depression is a lifelong illness. True or false? Depression is a lifelong illness. True or false? Okay. Question number two. This is also true or false. More than 50% of people with depression seek help. More than 50% of people with depression seek help. True or false? You know, during this time, there should be no talking, okay? And no nudging of the shoulder either, just. <laughs> Question number three. All right. People with depression are afraid of blank, blank. So there are two words you need to put in there. So you put A for the first blank, B for the second blank, okay? People with depression are afraid of blank, blank. Question number four. People with suicidal thoughts are seeking to end their blank. People with suicidal thoughts are seeking to end their blank. Put your answer in. Tomorrow we'll review um, these questions and the answers and see how we have done with these things tonight. May God bless you as we continue in our program. At this time, we'll have our health nuggets. Good evening. My name is Ruth Nike for Scent. Tonight Nugget is on 70 laws of self-care. What is self-care? The World Health Organization defines self-care as the ability of individuals, families, and communities to promote health, prevent disease, maintain health and cope with illness and disability with or without the support of a health worker. Healthcare is the things you consciously and deliberately do to take care of your physical, mental, and emotional health and well-being. Physical self-care entails taking care of your body through rest, nutrition, and exercise. Some examples of physical self-care include 
eating at irregular intervals, drinking lots of water throughout the day, taking a daily multivitamins, having a decent uh, night sleep, and joining an exercise class. Mental self-care entails cultivating a healthy attitude through mindfulness and curiosity. This can be accomplished through writing, meditation, thinking outside the box, developing a mental dumb list at the start of each day, and taking a deliberate break from screen time, uh, for instance, TV, internet, and phone use. Emotional. To practice emotional self-care, you want to develop uh, a healthy habits for coping with stress in your day-to-day -day life. For example, you want to watch your favorite movie, listen to music, affirm yourself, ask for help when needed, and set boundaries to protect your heart and mind. Environmental. To practice environmental self-care, you will need to reorganize your workspace to create a calming environment, explore or visit new places, organize your living space, go for walks outdoors, connect with your five senses. Spiritual activity or practice that brings meaning to your life and gives you spiritual care. Such activities or practices could be spending time in nature or in your community of faith, volunteering, and finding your core values. Creational. Create time for hobbies and things that interest you. By doing so, it will lead to recreational self-care activities. Some of these activities consist of hobbies, going on an adventure, spend time relaxing, playing board games or video games, listening to music, or just changing your daily routine. Social. Building relationships and connections while maintaining appropriate boundaries is the most effective strategy to practice social self-care. Connecting with friends, contacting your family members, writing a letter to an acquaintance, attending a support group, and, in, and interacting with an online community are all examples of social self-care. When you're feeling down or stressed, listen to your body and the type of self-care it needs. Taking time for you is crucial for maintain, to maintain overall health and wellness. This concludes our nugget on seven pillars of self-care. Thank you for listening and have a good evening. Amen, amen. So our journey continues this evening and I have the privilege to introduce to you our speaker this evening is uh, Chanel Christian. Amen. 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 Uh, Chanel is an ANCC board certified family psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. That was a mouthful for me. <laughs> I'm going to slow that down just a little bit. Amen. Amen. All of that, right? All right. So she is an ANCC board certified family psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner with years of experience in adult psychi um, psychiatry. Amen. <laughs> she has past experience in inpatient um, psychiatry, partial hospitalization, and community mental health. She has a Bachelor's of Science in Behavioral Neuroscience from Northeastern University and a Bachelor's of Science and a Master's of Science in Nursing from Regis College. Chanel is a first-generation Antiguan-American. 
She currently works at a major Boston hospital in the Adult Outpatient Behavioral Health Clinic. She has her own private practice, amen, and is an adjunct fa faculty professor at Regis College, amen, amen. When Chanel is not working, she enjoys spending time with her family, friends, and her dog named Archie, traveling and gardening. So after the song, you will be hearing from Sister Chanel. Amen. What an impressive, brilliant woman. I invite you, if you are here, to stand with us as we sing our theme song, Victory Belongs to Jesus. And good evening to our family online as well. I invite you to sing with us, because victory does belong to Jesus. Amen. against the king no one can no one will who can stand against my king no one can no Amen. 
You may be seated. Good evening. I just want to thank um, my family, friends, church family, colleagues, everyone who's been supporting me throughout the years. Um, I work in mental health. I, I love what I do. I love seeing, um, you know, patients when they improve they're happy they're able to get back to their lives go back to school travel you know anything that their hearts desire they're able to do and their mental health isn't um, hindering that um, so we're going to start by um, going over objectives and then I'll pray so um, our objectives this evening is to define anxiety then we're going to differentiate between normal anxiety and mental disorders Identify symptoms of general anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. Identify and debunk misconceptions about anxiety within the church. Discuss coping strategies and recognize the importance of seeking professional help and how to go about doing that. And then connecting biblical examples. This is um, an informational session. You'll get a lot of information from this. But I hope at the same time that you um, find that you're not alone, that God is with you, and he'll never forsake you. I'll bow your heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we gather this evening in your presence, requesting strength and faith as we navigate the uncertainties of anxiety. May this discussion bring support and inspiration to those who suffer from anxiety. In our times of uncertainty, please, um, give us the courage to um, trust in you and trust in your divine plan. Bless our hearts and minds. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay. So defining anxiety. So normal everyday anxiety, um, it's common and usually manageable. You have feelings of unease or worry um, throughout your daily life. It's a natural response to stressors and challenges. It's a normal part of human experience. Mild anxiety can be beneficial in some situations. It can alert us to dangers and help us prepare and pay attention. Normal anxiety is generally proportional to the situation and it doesn't incapacitate the individual. Um, common symptoms include feeling nervous, restless, or tense. Having an elevated heart rate, breathing rapidly, sweating, trembling, trouble concentrating, having trouble sleeping, some people experience GI problems, like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. Um, some people have the urge to avoid things that can trigger their anxiety. Normal day-to-day -day anxiety typically subsides once the stressor is removed or resolved. And it can be managed with um, coping tools. Coping tools can be um, like um, taking deep breaths, going for walks, calling a friend, listening to music, and praying. Examples of everyday um, anxieties include public speaking, job interviews, taking exams, social events, having to meet deadlines for school or for work, health concerns, you know, waiting for like test results to come back, traveling, moving or changes in your life, starting a new job, um, getting married, having kids, financial worries, concerns about money, debt, job security, and also relationship issues. Um, so I'm going to define generalized anxiety. That is a mental health disorder. We use the DSM-5 to diagnose. That's the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders. So to be diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, um, an individual must experience excessive worry and anxiety about a variety of events or activities more days than not for at least six months. The anxiety and worry are difficult to control and are accompanied by three or more of the following symptoms. That's restlessness or feeling on edge, being easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating or your mind going blank, irritability, muscle tension, and sleep disturbances. 
It's important to note that these symptoms must cause significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other areas of functioning. They are intense and persistent. Additionally, we have to rule out that anxiety and worry is not caused by other factors such as a medical condition. So usually you wanna check in with primary care, make sure you're running labs to make sure you aren't having issues, for example, with your thyroid or your heart. You also wanna rule out that the anxiety isn't related to substances. Anxiety disorders can cause people to avoid situations that trigger or worsen their symptoms. In some cases, with generalized anxiety disorder, there doesn't necessarily have to be a stressor that the individual um, is experiencing in their life. Sufferers sometimes are unable to identify what's causing the anxiety, so they don't know what to avoid. In and then the next um, disorder we're gonna review is obsessive compulsive disorder. So to be diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, um, the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both have to be present, and um, obsessions are defined by recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges, or images that are, that are experienced at some time during the disturbance, or intrusive and, and want, unwanted. And in the most individuals, um, cause marked anxiety or distress. The individual attempts to ignore or suppress such thoughts, urges, or images, or neutralize them with some other thought or action by performing, for example, by performing a compulsion. And a compulsion is defined as repetitive behaviors, such as hand washing, putting things in specific order, repeating or checking things, or mental acts like praying, counting, repeating, repeating words silently. Um, that the, in these behaviors, um, the individual feels driven to perform in response to an obsession or according to rules that must be applied rigidly. The behavior or mental acts are aimed to prevent or reduce anxiety or distress or preventing from some dreaded event or situation. However, these behaviors or mental acts are not connected to a realistic way with what they are designed to neutralize or prevent, or are clearly excessive. Um, so the obsessions or compulsions are time consuming. They can take more than one hour per day. And these are clinically significant, and they cause clinically significant distress or impairment in school, occupational, or other areas of functioning. These obsession and compulsive symptoms are not, again, they're not attributed to substances or a medical disorder. You have to make sure those are ruled out to get this diagnosis. Um, being so, a lot of people use the term OCD, um, you know, freely in, in daily conversation. So this is the actual diagnosis. So just being neat or orderly doesn't make you OCD. OCD is a debilitating disorder, and it, that takes normal activities. Sorry, normal anxieties like checking to make sure you lock the door, or shutting off the stove or disinfecting a surface and performing them compulsively to relieve intense, unbearable anxiety. It's difficult to maintain a job, run a household, or do anything if you feel you need to constantly perform any of these tasks multiple times in the day. And there's a sense of urgency. If rituals or repetitive actions are not carried out, sufferers feel like something bad will happen. Um, so misconceptions in the church so Christians are not immune to mental health struggles. Despite having faith, individuals may still face challenges related to mental well-being. Anxiety disorders are medical conditions. It is a disorder of the brain. It has to do with the way the brain works, with a chemical imbalance in the brain, or with the structure of the brain itself. It's important to know that mental illnesses such as anxiety disorders are caused are not caused by a lack of faith, inadequate prayer, unconfessed sins, or personal failure. They are quite simply a medical condition and should be treated as such. Just as Christians seek um, treatment for physical ailments like high blood pressure or diabetes, mental health con concerns should be addressed as well. The right medication and or the appropriate counseling can make a huge difference. 
And there are some good and caring Christian professionals working in the mental health field. Um, so the benefits of breaking down this stigma, that's the negative social ad attitudes and beliefs towards mental health. Um, so acknowledging anxiety disorders within their church can help to dismantle the stigma. There are numerous benefits, not only to individual, individuals facing mental health challenges, but society as a whole, fostering a more compassionate, understanding, and supportive community. Creating an atmosphere where individuals feel comfortable sharing their struggles enables the church community to offer support. Just as it is said in Galatians 6, 2, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. The collective support reflects the love and compassion taught by Jesus. So by breaking the stigma, we can increase help-seeking behavior. More people will feel safe to reach out and obtain the help that they need. We'll build stronger support networks, and people realize that they're not alone. It'll improve treatment outcomes. It'll build and restore confidence levels. It'll also enhance productivity and functionality at home or in church. Individuals will be able to carry out their church roles more effectively. Improve, um, it'll make a positive impact on their physical health and a positive impact on relationships. So where do you go to seek professional help? We keep saying that. Where do you go? So the first person you want to check in with will be your primary care provider. Um, they, your primary care provider can put in referrals, offer resources for you. You can also, if you can also check in with your insurance companies. If most insurance companies have a patient portal, there should be a directory on there. You can look um, for clinicians in your area. You can also check on websites like SockDoc or PsychologyToday.com. There you can also filter based on your preferences for providers. So once you start looking for care, you'll, also, you'll, be, um, you'll either see a therapist or someone, a prescriber to prescribe medications. So a therapist usually you'll have, oh, no, okay. So you, for therapy, you'll either see a LMHC, LCSW, LICSW or someone with their PsyD. Therapy sessions are usually weekly or bi-weekly. And if it gets to the point where coping tools and therapy isn't enough, you'll see um, someone that can prescribe medications. That'll be a psychiatrist, a physician assistant, or a nurse practitioner. Usually meet with us bi-weekly or monthly, and then sessions can be spread out um, based on the need after that. You can also if you need more immediate services and need more treatment, you could be referred to a partial hospitalization program or an intensive outpatient program. These are more, um, it'll require more of a time commitment. The day programs, you go in for group therapy, you can meet with someone that can also prescribe medications. You go to groups, you learn more about your mental health, coping tools, and stuff like that. If it gets to the point where you're no longer able to care for yourself, you're having suicidal, suicidal thoughts, um, you're just a harm to yourself or others, you can reach the point where you need the hospitalization. There is a quote that I found that I found interesting. It is, if you don't make time for your wellness, you'll be forced to make time for your illness. Yeah. So I usually ask my patients when they come in who are hesitant to start medications, because. By the time they come see me, someone referred them. They want to start the discussion about medications. I usually ask them, what do you have to lose? At this point, you're falling behind in school, you're falling behind at work, you're not able to hang, you know, spend time with your family and your friends. Treatment's supposed to improve your quality of life, not make it worse. And also, no one has to know that you're seeking mental health care. It's all confidential. Um, so integration of faith and mental health. So we're, gonna, we're shifting this narrative that Christians don't battle anxiety. And there are several biblical figures who face situations that can't be interpreted as anxiety-inducing. So we'll review those um, now. 
So the first person is Job. Job, a righteous man, faced immense suffering and loss, including the death of his children and losing his fortune. Through all his trials, Job experienced deep distress and questioned God. He even had people around him who blamed him, saying that he was being punished due to something he did unpleasing to God. But he did not give up. In the end, God restored Job's, Job's fortune, is illustrating that even in the face of profound anxiety, trusting in God's ultimate plan can lead to restoration. Peter, um, when Peter, sorry, when Jesus walked on water, Peter, Peter expressed a desire to join him, but became frightened by the stormy sea. As Peter started to sink, he cried out to Jesus for help. Jesus immediately reached out and saved him, saying, You of little faith, why did you doubt? This narrative illustrates that even the closest followers of Jesus may experience anxiety, yet all, yet all we have to do is turn to him. Moses. When God called Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, Moses expressed anxiety and doubt about the ability to fulfill the task. God reassured Moses and provided him with signs and miracles to confirm his presence and guidance. The story illustrates that when, even, when great leaders may experience anxiety, God equips and supports those he calls. The woman with the issue of blood. A woman who suffered from a bleeding issue for 12 years approached Jesus in a crowd. She had sought healing in various from various physicians without success. In her desperation, she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and instantly she was healed. This story shows how the power of faith in overcoming physical and emotional distress. Esther's courage in approaching the king. Queen Esther faced anxiety when approached with the task of saving her people from destruction. The weight of the responsibility led her to seek divine intervention through prayer and fasting. The disciples in the storm. When Jesus and the disciples were caught in the, an intense storm in the Sea of Galilee, the disciples became anxious and fearful. Jesus demonstrated his authority over nature and calmed the storm. This teaches... This narrative teaches that even in the midst of life storms, trusting in Jesus can bring peace and alleviate anxiety. The parable of the prodigal son. The younger son in this parable experienced anxiety and despair after squandering his inheritance. When he returned home expecting judgment, his father welcomed him with open arms. This story highlights God's unconditional love and forgiveness, providing solace to those who feel overwhelmed by guilt and shame. Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel's firm faith in God led him into a den of lions as a consequence for his refusal to stop praying. Despite the anxiety of facing imminent danger, God protected Daniel, and he emerged unharmed. This story emphasizes the idea of trusting in God can overcome even the most frightening challenges. And Joseph. Joseph, sold into slavery by his brothers and falsely accused, faced numerous trials. Despite his consequences, he maintained his faith in God. Eventually, he rose to a position of power in Egypt and forgave his brothers. And this short story shows how trusting in God can lead to eventual triumph over adversity and anxiety. Okay, so this brings us to coping strategies for anxiety. So the first one is prayer and meditation. What better way to find peace, what better way but to find peace in God's word? Amen. Trusting in God's plan. Set aside time each day for quiet reflection, prayer, and meditation to reduce stress or anxiety. Explore passages that offer comfort and assurance during difficult times. Psalms 34, 17 to 18. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. We can also find comfort in the belief that God works in all things for our good, for all those who love him, in Romans 8, 28. Amen. Isaiah 41, 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous hands. Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, will trans which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Matthew 6, 33. Matthew, yeah, Matthew 6, 33 and 34. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things shall be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for, for the day is its own trouble. All right, the next coping strategy is deep breathing exercises. Deep breathing exercises can help to activate the body's relaxation response, reducing anxiety, and promoting a sense of calm. Mindfulness practices. Mindfulness, such as mindful breathing, body scan, meditation, or mindful walking can help, help you stay grounded and reduce your anxiety. Journaling. Write down thoughts and feelings. Writing down thoughts and feelings can be a therapeutic way to process emotions and reduce anxiety. Having a strong support network can help reduce feelings of loneliness and anxiety. Reach out to friends, family members, or fellow church members for support and connection. You can also consider joining a support group or seeking therapy for additional support and guidance. Your network can also include professionals within the, church, within the Christian community. Grounding techniques. Grounding techniques help you stay rooted in the present moment, reducing feelings of disconnection and anxiety. Setting boundaries. Learning to say no and set boundaries is important for managing anxiety. Sometimes it's important to prioritize, prioritize your own needs and not overcommitting to avoid feeling overwhelmed. Practice gratitude and positive thinking. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. Um, you'll be integrating positive thinking and aff affirm affirmations into daily life. Um, simply take time each day to reflect on things you're grateful for. Replace negative thoughts with more realistic and positive statements, such as, I can handle this. I overcame challenges before. Physical exercise. Regular exercise can help reduce anxiety by releasing endorphins, improving mood, and promoting relaxation. Healthy lifestyle habits. Um, adopting healthy lifestyle habits such as getting enough sleep, eating a balanced diet, and staying hydrated can help reduce anxiety. Okay, I have a few true or false questions. Just make sure you guys are paying attention. So the first one, Christians should rely solely on prayer to overcome anxiety. True or false? False. <laughs> Okay, while prayer is a valuable aspect of coping and seeking guidance, mental health challenges often require a holistic approach. Professional support and therapy, if necessary, and if necessary, medication can be an essential factor for treatment. Next one, anxiety symptoms sometimes have an obvious external cause. False? Yes, false. Anxiety symptoms can manifest without a clear external trigger. 
Anxiety disorders often involve a combination of genetic, environmental, and neurobiological factors. Understanding that anxiety can be internal and not solely tied to external circumstances helps to avoid generalizations. All right, next one. Recognizing the complex nature of mental health challenges helps dispel misconceptions and reduce stigma within the church. True. Acknowledging the complex causes of mental health issues fosters a more improved and empathetic approach, promoting a culture of understanding and acceptance. Next question. Um, seeking professional help for mental health is a lack of trust in God. False. Seeking professional help for a mental health for your mental health does not indicate a lack of trust in God. God can work through trained professionals and their therapeutic process to bring healing. Just as individuals seek medical help for physical ailments, seeking mental health support is a re responsible and proactive step towards well-being. Integrate next one, integrating biblical teachings. Biblical teachings about love, compassion, and empathy aligns with the with promoting mental health awareness and understanding in the church. I'll read it again. Integrating biblical teachings about love, compassion, empathy aligns with promoting mental health awareness and understanding in the church. It's true. Incorporating biblical doctrine, doctrines in discussions about mental health helps create a framework that encourages understanding and compassionate support within the church community. Okay, next one. Medication for mental health is incompatible with Christian beliefs. False. Medication when prescribed by healthcare professionals can be a legitimate and effective part of mental treatment. It is essential to recognize the mental health conditions often are biological, have biological causes and medication can play a role in managing symptoms. Next one, sharing struggles with mental health Sharing struggles with mental health in the church leads to judgment and isolation. <laughs> it's supposed to be false. <laughs> while there may be intent, while there may be instances of judgment, promoting awareness and education about mental health reduces stigma. Many churches are evolving to become more safe spaces for individuals to share their struggles receive support and find community. The next one, encouraging self-care practices, including rest and stress management, is consistent with valuing the well-being of body and mind. True. Recognizing the importance of self-care lands with biblical principle of stewardship, emphasizing the responsibility to care for one's physical and mental health. And the last one, if someone looks calm, they can't be experiencing anxiety. False. Anxiety can manifest internally. Individuals may conceal their symptoms. The absence of visible signs does not negate the possibility of someone experiencing anxiety. All right, final thoughts. We should find a balance between faith and mental health care while trusting in God is sent. While trusting in God is essential to managing anxiety, it is important that we can that we are able to differentiate between normal anxieties and clinical disorders to know when to seek professional intervention when necessary. Ultimately, acknowledging anxiety disorders in the church aligns with teaching of Jesus, promoting love, compassion, and support for one another. By drawing on biblical examples and scriptures, the church can be a sanctuary where individuals find understanding, hope, and healing in their journey with anxiety. I'm gonna invite Pastor up for the appeal. And we have an awesome opportunity to accept the assurance that comes through Jesus Christ. We've learned so much tonight, amen? And what I like is that we can go to Scripture, and Scripture provides us 
with a way of understanding this. I love that passage in Philippians where God says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, make your requests known. I also love that Jesus says, why worry? Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You've heard the word of God. And tonight we want to embrace the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. For those of you who are online, the number on the screen, someone may just want to give their hearts to the Lord. Sister Chanel shared the story of the prodigal son. Imagine the anxiety that he had trying to come back home. Would my father accept me? Is there still room? But he makes that bold step to go back home. And daddy was there waiting with open arms. Someone might be anxious tonight about the acceptance of God. Does God love me? Would God accept me? I've made so many mistakes. I've messed up. We've learned from the word of God that God loves us unconditionally. Someone who wants to be baptized, I need you to text baptism to the number on the screen. He loves you and he wants to welcome you into his arms. Or maybe there is someone like the woman with the issue of blood that we learned about tonight who had tried so many physicians and rather than getting better, got worse. But her faith was in Jesus. She said, if I could just touch his garment... I know that I'm going to be made well. Someone might be struggling with something that makes you anxious. It may be an illness. It may be a situation in your family. It may be a situation uh, at your job. It may be a situation with your children. And like this woman, you want to be able to say, Jesus, I still believe that you are able to make a difference. If you desire prayer, text prayer to that number that is on the screen. For those of you who want Bible study to learn more about this God who says be anxious for nothing, we want to study with you. Text Bible to that number. For those of you who are here tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to turn over to God your entire being asking him tonight to give you peace that passes understanding. If it is your desire tonight to say, God, give me your peace, would you stand with me? For those of you who are online and following this, I want to give you that same opportunity. God, I want your peace. Would you just type peace in the chat? Type peace in the chat. Now, I want to reiterate something that our preacher made clear tonight. Trusting in God does not rule out getting professional help. Getting professional help doesn't mean that we don't trust in God. Seeking professional help does not mean that, that we, we, we are not praying enough or we are not studying the Word of God enough. No. The children of God, we can go through challenges and still have our faith in God. And God can use professionals to help us in that journey. Amen. And so even as we make this decision and this commitment tonight, for some, part of your walk with God might include seeking professional help. And sometimes it may include even getting medication. And that does not go against the Word of God. It is consistent with the Word of God. Amen? In Scripture, there are times where God healed people by just speaking the Word. And there are other times where some type of medication was prescribed and God brought healing through those mediums. Amen? And so tonight, we're going to seek God, but we'll also seek professional help should that be necessary. Would you pray with me? Father, tonight's message challenged us in so many ways. 
we heard about the various aspects of anxiety. We heard about other types of phobias, fears. We, we heard about OCD. We heard about these things, God, that we live with. Many of us live with these things as Christians. And sometimes because of the stigma around these mental illnesses, we find ourselves trying to hold this in. We find ourselves feeling isolated. We find ourselves feeling misunderstood. How can I come in the context of the church and say I'm struggling with anxiety? How can I come into the body of Christ and, and say I, my mind is racing and I can't slow my mind down? I, I feel as if the worst will happen. I thank you tonight, God, that you have revealed to us that you understand that journey and that you are with us in that journey and you have provided, God, knowledge. You have provided professionals. You have provided scientific research, God, to help us get through these journeys. Above all, God, you have given us faith in you. That if we trust in you, you will walk with us through these journeys. Your word says, why are you downcast, O my soul? Hope thou in God. Tonight, Lord, I pray for those who have decided to give their hearts to you through baptism. Seal their decisions for you. I pray for those who have decided that they, they just want prayer. They want to be prayed with and prayed for. I lift them up to you, God, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you will come alongside them and walk with them through this journey. You said, fear not, for I am with you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you go through the waters, they will not overflow you. When you go through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not be kindled upon you. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the midst of the fire, you are there with us. Like Daniel that we heard about tonight, you are in our lion's den. We have nothing to fear because you are with us. For those who requested Bible study, I pray that you will seal their decisions and their commitment as they learn more about you and they walk with you. For those of us standing tonight, for those of us who have indicated in the chat that we need peace, we're asking not just for ourselves, but for our family members and our friends and our co-workers, fill us with the peace that comes from you. In the name of Jesus, God, take us by the hand. Speak to us your words of comfort and your words of assurance, Father. Tonight, Lord, I pray for someone who is so anxious that it is affecting their lives, it's affecting their marriage, it's affecting their jobs, it's affecting their friendships, their relationships, it's affecting every aspect of their lives. I pray tonight, Lord, that they will find assurance in you and they will get the help that they need in the name of Jesus to get through this. That someone will know tonight, you are not alone, you are not alone, you are not alone. Help is available. Help is on the way. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we surrender to you and we accept the assurance we find in you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Were you blessed tonight? Let's praise God. Let's praise God. Let's praise God. Amen. I am so blessed. Thank you, Sister Chanel. Thank you to all the wonderful folks that have been ministering to us. The more we sing this song, I'm reminded that God is turning it around and he's giving us very real and tangible resources. Tonight I was challenged to explore those resources and we don't have to suffer in our ignorance. So praise God. Thank you once again. Sooner or later, it'll turn in my favor. Sooner or later, it'll turn. It's turned. 
And I want to say this message that you, that you gave tonight is not going to just stop here. It. It's on YouTube. We're going to we so send it out to your friends because guess what? I needed that tonight because I do get anxious sometimes. God knows. Okay, and um, also it's good to know that because we are Christians, that does not stop us from getting help. Okay, and either and if people think that we are crazy getting help, then they're the ones that are crazy. Because if we don't do that, we were told tonight, if you don't take time for your wellness, you will have to take time for your illness. We don't want to do that. May God help us. And I'm so blessed. We're so blessed tonight. Just want to thank you. And um, so as we wrap up tonight, there's more powerful days that are coming. Tomorrow, 6 p.m., there's the Forgiveness, Guilt, and Shame group by Dr. Gail Crump Swaby and Sister Michelle Clark. This is at 6 p.m. And also at 7 p.m. Um, with Sister Michelle Grumpling with Guilt, Shame, and Suicidal Ideations. Um, so there's a lot coming. And a lot, a lot of people think about suicide because sometimes life gets so rough. So come out and support and let's pray for our young people as they bring us these messages. All right, and tonight, we are going to pray, we're going to close out, and there is refreshment downstairs. Amen. Again, again, we want to thank you, Sister Chanel. Thank you. Let's stand for our closing prayer. And again, I want to thank you all for coming, those who are online. And please, do us a favor, send the messages out, because just about everyone can use it. All right? Thank you so much. Almighty God, we are so grateful um, for... What went on tonight, also for Sister, um, Sister Amy who sang that song, God is turning it around for us. Because Lord, here we are, we are getting help and our eyes are being opened and Lord, we can look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. Oh my God, we just want to praise you tonight for what you did here in High Park and what you will continue to do for the rest of the week. Bless and cover Sister Chanel who brought us the word tonight, oh God, and may you cover everyone, Lord. Those who are anxious and nervous, some people, Lord, they don't want to leave their rooms, oh God. May you meet with somebody even now and let them know it's okay. It's okay to get help, and I'm here to help you. Most of all, may we put our trust in you. We thank you, we bless you, we praise you, and we magnify you for what you have done here tonight for us. Take us all home safely, we pray, and bless the refreshment downstairs in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.